that's it then. All right, I'm going to stop the stream. Thanks, everybody, for watching. <laughs> now another question. <laughs> uh, so you, you talked about uh, when you de-innervate that they shall fill in that there was one situation where they say you move apart. Well, there's, there's, well, there's two ways you could damage, right? One is you could lose the neural tissue in the cortex. Right. So the neurons are damaged. So now the inputs are going into that, don't have anywhere to go. So what they'll do is they, they'll, they'll go, oh, okay. they'll, they'll okay. spread out, or, or more actively what will happen is neurons at the edge of the damage, this is what I think is going on, this is my interpretation, neurons at the edge of the damage will see that those axons are, I can, they can, he can fruitfully find patterns in it and not get inhibited by somebody else. So that those neurons will say, I'm going to start representing those inputs. Remember these axons are always... One thing I didn't mention is these axons and dendrites are always like probing, they're always going in at very rapidly, you know, in the order of days and hours. So they're like little, like little worms, they're going in and out all the time. And so everyone's trying to find new connections all the time. And um, so, so a neuron will say, hey, there's some guys who are not being represented. If I, on our system will do this. If I connect to them, I can get that pattern by myself. And if I get the pattern by myself, no one's gonna inhibit me, you know? So they will naturally want to grab that information. And so, therefore, what it look like the actions are now representing moving out like this, and then th those people start representing those patterns, and other people start moving over. So, every, you know, everybody does. Or the other way, you could just lose the input. See, all the neural tissue is, is sustained, mm -hmm. but now you have no input. So now you have now you have neurons that are not getting any input, and they start getting greedy and taking their neighbors. So one is one is you neurons get greedy, start taking the inputs from their neighbors, and the other is neurons are dead. And the surrounding neurons see, oh, there's some fruitful input I can get, and, and they start representing the whole. I think both of those occur, because um, you can recover from both types of damage. You can recover from the little death of nerve cells in the cortex, and you can recover somewhat from loss of innervation. Uh, again, if you do too big an area, it doesn't work. Um, yeah. I have a question about uh, inhibitor neurons. So the only way a neuron can inhibit the others Parameter neurons can't, as far as I know, have no way of directly inhibiting other neurons. Okay. No, they don't. Uh, but the inhibitory cells are really complex because okay. they can inhibit pyramidal cells, they can inhibit other inhibitory cells, they can excite other inhibitory cells. They have all kinds of, they're like bag of tricks. They can do all kinds of weirdo stuff. Well, what is the communication like? How, how does the inhibitory cells know uh, when to inhibit other ones? Does it see one part of the neuron firing first and then just inhibit all other Well, the inhibitory neurons are like every other neuron. They, they have a cell body. They have dendrites, right? And they get input. They, have, they get excitatory and inhibitory. Um, they get excitatory and inhibitory inputs, just like pyramidal cells. And they generate a spike, you know, just like pyramidal cells. Mm -hmm. Although... Uh, their physiology can be quite different. So they might generate, first of all, they can be very fast in responding. Some of them, like the basket cells, are extremely fast. Okay. Um, they'll send out the spike right away. They also, there's some of them that are bursting, like they'll, they'll, they'll rapid train, rapid firing. Um, so they're like, I'm going to hit everyone. <laughs> and uh, so the physiology varies quite a bit. And how they respond, and of course, what kind of inputs they're getting. So the general answer to your question is no one really knows the answer to your question. Um, there's no like you can't say, oh, this cell is going to fire when something happens. We've proposed some answers to that. I was just talking about how these bipolar cells, these double bouquet cells, could be recognizing, if they recognize the same input pattern, as they, they're going to learn. Sometimes what we, what we really believe is going on is that the, the spatial pooler works on these double bouquet cells. So the double BK cells learn the input patterns and they space themselves out. And once they've done that, as they do that, then they just basically train a whole bunch of other cells to fire along with them. So they have to be connected to all those other cells. And they, they, and they do, and they look like it. Okay. Uh, so uh, in fact, um, um, Yeah, I mean, I have some notes here I wrote down. Like, there's different types of inhibitory cells and where they connect 
to the excitatory cells. Um, so uh, these bipolar cells here connect generally, if I was, an, if I was a pyramidal cell, uh, the bipolar cells make synapses on the cell body and the proximal dendrite. So they have a very strong effect on whether the cell generates a spike at all. There are, an, and so that's basically, I'm going to shut down this cell from firing at all. There's another type of cell, so that would be basket cells. Those are what we think is um, that sort of the, the inhibition that occurs within a column. Uh, oh no, so did I, that's not that, but that's uh, it basket cells? It is. Yeah, that's basket cells and it's bipolar cells. Oh no, I'm, I'm wrong about that. Yeah, wait a minute, I'm going to take this back. I'm not confused here. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. Anyway, there's another type of cell called the chandelier cell, which we have no idea what it's for. Um, and it, 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 they call it a chandelier cell because what it does, it makes connections uh, along the beginning of the axon here, and it looks like little candles. So there's a whole bunch of these little candles suspended out like a chandelier. And you may say, well, why would, the, why would a chandelier cell do this and a basket cell or a bipolar cell do this? Well, basket cells and bipolar cells would prevent the cell from firing at all. Uh, it would gen never generate a spike. Um, but it's possible, and I, I'm just making this up. It's totally making this up. It's possible the chandelier cell, um, if it was depending where these synapses actually formed here, it might be possible for um, the, uh, the cell to generate a spike but not propagate down the axon. axon. Uh, it's possible. So I'm just pointing out there are these, these are differences. There's all these very complex differences that are going on here. So this could say, oh, I'm going to let this cell generate a spike, but it's, nobody else is going to know about it. So in that sense, this cell, if, I, a shand, if, if a chandelier cell worked this way, and we have no theory to suggest it does, it would allow this cell to learn, but not affect anybody else. Axons branch sometimes as well, right? Is it possible? Oh, they all branch. So is possible chandelier cells also prevent one path of the axon from continuing? So they you know, inhibit later on after the first branch? Nah, no, they're only at the beginning here. Oh, really? They're only close at the, to the cell body. They're close to the cell body. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of any. I'm not aware of any uh, inhibitory neurons that are far down the branch. So the, the branch of a, of, a, of a cell, is an axon, is really quite confused because it's going to make five, 10,000 synapses, right? So there's a lot of synapses out here. Um, I'm not aware of any inhibitory synapses anywhere along here. Uh, it's sort of like once it gets past here, it goes everywhere. There's no selectivity here. That is different. There's another class of uh, inhibitory cells. Um, oh gosh, I, I, I don't remember which one is now. There's a, so I talked about I talked about two types here. Some are right right in the beginning of the axon. Some are right near the cell body, right? There are other types of inhibitory cells, which um, if you looked, if I if I let me just draw some of these dendrites here, right? that they, they're spaced along here, intermixed with the excitatory cells. I wish I wouldn't have stopped the stream. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, Matt. Um, and so what these, you know, no one knows what these are doing. One, one possible way of thinking about this, and the way I've always thought about it is, well, why would you have these, these inhibitory synapses along the synapse, along the dendrites like that? This would be a way of regulating the threshold for um, the dendritic spikes, right? So we generate a dendritic spike, and what you could do is you could say, okay, uh, if I'm going to make a prediction, uh, the prediction is going to be recognized as a pattern of activity out here. Uh, I can change how easy it is I make the prediction and how less I make the prediction. So the example I always gave is, I said, well, if you're looking at a cloud, and I said, oh, so you see the dog in the cloud? No, of course, there's no dog in the cloud, right? There's no dog out there. But you can somehow defocus your brain a bit, and all of a sudden you can see a dog right, in the cloud. So what's going on there? What happens when I say, you see the dog? Um, one possible explanation is that the brain doesn't see a pattern. It says, OK, let's just turn down the threshold until something pops out. 
So, so now you get a really crude dog until some, something will eventually show up. If you just keep lowering the threshold, these guys, some of these guys are going to start spiking. And, and, that's a, and you can argue that's kind of a sense of uh, generalization. Um, but this would generally, this will allow you to regulate, these would allow you to regulate how many um, dendritic spikes are being generated. And so, um, which you'd want to do, you'd want to say if I have a very clear pattern of something I've learned before, I don't need many synapses. But if it's a fuzzy pattern, or it's a cloud, or it's different than I saw before, I could just say, hey, you know what, let's all try to figure out, let's do the best job we can. And the best job we can is to keep lowering the threshold until I have something comes out. And then I'll say, oh yeah, I see the dog in the cloud, or I see a duck in the cloud, or whatever it is. So those are the three, I think those are the three basic classes of how excitatory cells get inhibited. At the cell body, the beginning of the axon, and then distributed around the dendrites. Um, and we have, we've never really postulated a theory for this one, but I have a theory for that one. We know we have theories for this one. Um, but I always thought, like, maybe we could come up with a scenario where our cells need to fire, they need to learn, but we really don't want to do anything. Well, I guess that would be kind of like uh, imagination. Right? I want to think about doing something. I want to think about going over there and picking up match robots and carrying them here. Well, I'm not doing it, but I'm thinking like it. Oh, I'm going to do it. So maybe, I don't know, maybe what I'm doing there is I'm letting, I don't know how, I don't know how to work. I've just made that up. Who knows? But for some reason, you can have cells that could fire and learn, but not do anything. That was the answer to that one, maybe. All right, sorry, Matt. <laughs> I have actually one question. It's, Lucas, it's Lucas's fault. He's asking questions. Sorry, man. So right now, our temporal memory is it as if we have one inhibitor cell per mini column, which is connected to all cells. So yeah. it's, it's able to inhibit any yeah. cell. Uh, is it unreasonable if we have a model where we have, let's say, three or four inhibitor cells per mini column that have different receptor fields, so we can have like each inhibitor cell connected to a subsection of the mini column? Well, so it's reasonable, but, but I don't have any evidence for that. Right? That would suggest that subsets of the mini column respond to different things. Is that conceptually any different from just having four mini columns? Like, oh, split, good point. splitting one into four different mini columns? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. So, maybe not. Yeah, I don't think it is. Here's what I do think is going on. The basket cells, which are the ones that we think are doing this, because they're really, really fast. They're like super fast inhibitors. Um, they don't just connect to a mini column. They connect to multiple. They connect to a cloud. And so a winning cell would inhibit not just its local cells in the, in the mini column, but other cells in other mini columns. Mm -hmm. And that's not inconsistent with our theory, because um, uh, we don't model it that way, but um, but in general, you wouldn't want uh, in the brain. You wouldn't want uh, this mini column becoming active and this mini column becoming active, right? So then, either the either the um, the double case cells have to inhibit each other, or maybe it's really maybe the whole thing is happening is that each of the double case cells, which are defining the mini column. Uh, they, they might compete through the basket cells, so they, they all the basket cells come active and then hit everyone else, something like that. So it's it's not it's it's not as simply laid out as the way we did it. Uh, we we have a simplification of this, and that's almost all because we decided a long time ago we weren't going to be modeling topology. That is, we weren't going to be modeling the idea that this mini column and this mini column and this mini column are representing the same feature at some spatial displacement on the on the sensory organ. Like our our uh, our uh, encoders don't have topology, you know. Um, we could we could do that. We modeled that for a little bit, and we said let's not do it anymore. Well, you can do it with the spatial pooler. We just don't have any encoders that take advantage of it. Oh, and so it's really computationally costly. So we can do it with the spatial pooler. Meaning the code is in there for them? No, there's no encoders for it. But but it but it but you can, you know, use local inhibition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and we did that initially. We started off that way, and then we decided that was wrong. Mary Andy, I think, said, this is really costly. Why are we doing this? Because <laughs> the things we were encoding didn't really require it. And, um, and so, yeah, we, we, we abandoned that, and then we never went back to it. But it worked, and it worked both ways, so um, it didn't seem to bother anything. You mentioned that uh, nearby 
mean columns uh, will be activated. So you activate one and you have a little bit less net activation nearby. So Under like the condition when they're doing, that's, I mean, when, when they're part of a map. What's that? When they're part of a cortical map. Yeah, but when they're, that, that condition, I want to point out is the only time I know that occurs is when they're actually trying to give like figure out what these mini columns represent. Like they're they're doing the sinusoidal grading thing. Uh, I, see. I don't know if that's true. Yeah. I don't know if that's true during real life. But could so if it, if it was true in real life, could there be some benefits of um, being able to kind of well, you know, why do we have mini columns represent similar things nearby each other? One potential explanation is that they're sort of predictive. And that these mm. gradings that are close to each other at an angle actually appear close to each other. Yeah. The statistics of the world as well, so they can sort of predict that if this column is active, the nearby mini columns are actually likely to be active soon as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, there's other strange stuff going on here too. We now believe, of course, that there are grid cells down here, and grid cells, as far as we know, always have this sort of um, uh, bump of activation, you know, sort of a peak and a decline, always. And so some of these cells down here are representing a location in a bumpy way, and that may be actually what's the driving the bumpiness up here. We don't really know, so the, <laughs> there's a lot of weird stuff going on. Right, but from grid cells and location, you do get this idea of um, kind of a, there's a, a spatial, there's a space that you're in that's somehow spatial, and nearby locations in that space yes. are more yeah. likely to be yes. activated because of the yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you could argue the same thing for the, the, the input representation, but, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Why would I have nearby mini columns represent this, you know, similar thing? Um, it's also interesting that these cortical maps don't exist in, in all mammals equivalently. So I know that like uh, the color space in visual cortex is map map like you get these spirals of color, yeah. and columns that have yeah. a spiral around it. But I think in the cat cortex you don't get that. You get salt and pepper um, color. Yeah, um, well, like does a cat even have color vision? Yeah. Are you talking about the same thing? You're talking about color. You're talking about like the pinwheels of like orientation yeah, selectivity, so not not color vision. Well, well, I think I think it's color selectivity. So it's oh, color vision. okay. But there's also I don't know if color selectivity is pinwheel, but it might be. Is it? Or nearby colors that represent? I don't know. How does it work? Sorry, I, I thought you were talking about one thing. You're talking about another. So. Uh. But anyway, just the, the fact that these maps exist in some places and some like mammals and not others is interesting. Yeah. I think and that's. Why? I mean, the the, the mound castle basically says like. It shouldn't matter what your inputs represent at all, right? There's going to be some, within some patch of sensory input, there's going to be a spectrum of different properties, and we're going to do the spatial pool of trick on all of them. So they're all, we're going to basically divide up, come up with a set of mini columns that, that, that is a good uh, a projection of that set of, um, of properties. So no matter what input you get, you're going to get a sparse representation across all the properties, across all the modalities. I mean, it's a very general idea. Uh, that is not a new idea to us. It's been around for a while. Uh, a lot of people have written about that. So like, it seems like the cortex can take any set of properties, you know, color, you know, um, and, and luminosity or left and right eye or whatever you want to give it, and it'll just sort of create an efficient map of them all uh, so they equally represented in intersections. So remember, I might have several hundred mini columns within a single column, and each mini column, even though there's, I should have drawn this too. I'm sorry, Matt. Um, Technically, we are still recording if we want to upload the recording. Oh, okay. I mean, that's, we're not streaming, but we're recording. Uh, yeah, I might need to. Um, so if you look at actually, I've drawn this picture quite a few times. Marcus will know this picture. <laughs> this is the, this is a cube of cortex, right? And so we've been saying, hey, we've got these little mini columns here. They're like, you know, imagine how skinny these guys are. You know, these are like these are like a 30 to 40 to 1 aspect ratio. They're really like little skinny things. Um, and so this might represent a full, um, you know, rotation of the input phase. But what's going on in this dimension? Well, what it looks like is in the visual cortex, these, these orientation mini columns are really orientation slabs. Uh, excuse me. So you actually have a slab of cells that all share the same orientation. But then you have other features that are mapped on in other ways. So then I might have 
oh, I'm going to map on ocular dominance or, or color or something else, and they're going to go across like this. They're going to go, you know, and the other guy's going, so, so anyway. The second dimension slab is going to be some other. Well, or there's actually more than two dimensions. You, I mean, it starts, it seems like there's a base division, which is this guy. And then the other dimensions, you've seen these, maybe you've seen these little weird blobby, lava lamp-like patterns right. that sort of cut across all these. So, so, you know, there'll be like, you know, some other pattern that's, you know, that's, that's repeating it across some ziggly lines like this. The point is you can map multiple dimensions onto this thing. So even though there's a slab of orientation, individual minicoms in that, that all, there's multiple minicoms of that orientation that have different subsets or different sets of the other properties. And so uh, when you actually form a sparse activation, you'd be forming not just between these minicoms, but between minicoms of different things. Uh, we haven't done anything with that. Um, so that it looks like a self-organizing map. It is, yeah. And I think that that idea goes back a long time to, uh, oh, what's his name? I can't remember his name now. Yeah, well, the guy I think coined the term self-organizing. It was a Cajonan? Cajonan. Yeah. Yeah, Cajonan. Tuevo Cajonan. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, a key to the minicom theory is that the vertical dimension does not vary on these properties. The other dimensions, yes. however yes. they are yes. are varying. That's on the key properties. part of the theory. Um, but again, we know that the minicom hypothesis is, is a very subtle subset of what's actually going on. Because we know that there's all these different types of cells that are doing different things in this column here. So when they, when they first started doing this, they were basically looking at layer four, or maybe layer three initially, uh, and they couldn't even record from these cells down here. And then they started, and so they were basically saying, oh, that we're just looking at a bunch of cells here close to the top, two, or three, four, or something like that. And then, um, and even then, they're only looking at a small subset of the cells. It turns out that I think it's a majority of the cells do not respond like this. Right. The very active cells are the ones that that they basically go by all the cells that are silent or that are emitting spikes that don't correlate to this or emitting one spike every once in a while. And I referred to this talk that this woman gave at Coastline a couple of years ago, which I thought was very impressive. She made this point. She said, look, you know, when we do these experiments, we're skipping, you know, 60% of the cells or 70% of the cells because they, they don't, they're not doing what we expect them to do. And she said, but they do emit spikes. Just not very, they don't seem to be very correlated. They sort of every once in a while they made a spike, or they don't seem to, they fire when we don't expect them to fire. So she did some sort of analysis where she looked at all those other cells that she could record from that didn't seem to do the right thing. And she showed that they correlated, their firing did correlate with high, high level sort of uh, experiences. So they weren't uncorrelated. They just didn't do this basic firing, you know, this basic simple thing, which makes sense. I mean, and, and like if we think some of these are the spiceman cells, some of these are the grid cells, some of these are you know motor driven cells, whatever. All these, there's temporal pooling, um, all these things which don't make sense in this context. We would expect them to have different firing patterns, but you could still have this basic idea that, and, and now it's been proven that there are cells throughout every layer that do have this basic property. It's just it's just a, it's a subset of all these cells. So there's some sort of you know there's some sort of um, uh, receptive field property that all these guys, and some of these things share in some sense, but, in the, but it, they, could be, they could be representing you know, location, they can represent an orientation, they can represent temporal pooling, all these different things that they could be represent, you know, that, that the, the column can be representing, even though a subset are being, there's some sort of unifying tying together uh, of them in, in some way, but they're actually doing lots of different things. And that's, we never really, I mean, that's part of what I, I really want to get to the bottom of uh, on a theory point of view. Um, is really kind of a full model of how do you explain this structure, the different functions, and all the things that the cortex has to do. And I actually think we're close to that. I think we're pretty close to that. Well, one of the things that's always interesting to me is, is that uh, when we've looked at kittens and looked at the, at the pinwheel patterns of orientation, I mean, the use of color to decode it, you know, uh, it has nothing to do with what's actually, uh, it's, it's just a representation so we can understand it. But the kittens, the, the patterns, Yeah, they, yeah, they're actually, they're, even if they're there at birth, they get 
definitely reinforced and right. clear and strong, and they learned it. But then you have animals like the caribou, which within an hour after birth has to get up and move with the herd. Yeah. So how do you have a fully developed visual system before you have significant amount well, of Well, so input? they don't have a fully developed visual system. Um, the, the, here's the way to think about that. It's, it's stop talking about vision for a moment. Let's, let's talk about walking, okay? You, a child doesn't learn to walk until like, what, one year old or something like that. But um, a zebra or a caribou or whatever can start walking within minutes, right? Um, we don't, the way I view this is we don't learn to walk. We have an undeveloped nervous system when we're, we're born. We're born too early. So walking is not controlled by the near cortex. Walking is controlled by the brainstem and the spinal cord, mostly sure. the spinal cord. And so if you were born with a fully developed brainstem and spinal cord, you too would walk at birth. But we're born premature. Now, I think in vision, there's, there's vision also occurs in old parts of the brain. So it's not just in the neocortex. There's the superior colliculus that is an old part. Of, it's basically old, evolutionarily old visual system. And, uh, and it's been shown that uh, in primates, like our fear of snakes and spiders is genetic. So you're born with that. And it's the old part of the brain. You don't have to learn that. Right? And it's the old part of the brain that knows that. So uh, the fact that, uh, you know, I think some animals are born and able to start running right away uh, doesn't mean they know the world. It just means they have enough of the old brain that they can do these basic functions, but they still have to learn a lot. Um, so that's how I, it's, I don't, I don't think those are uh, examples which are sort of counter to the whole theory here. They just, you really have to just say when was the, what was the maturity of the old, the, the part of the brain. The neocortex still hasn't learned anything. Um, the, the, the caribou probably cannot um, recognize, you know, com he's certainly not going to how to get to the water hole, you know, coming right out of the uterus, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has to be able to follow, basically it has to be able to walk and follow and find, you know, find mother's milk. And... <laughs> Uh, and run from fear and just run randomly. Um, so that can be done without really much learning. Uh, that could be all evolved. And um, we do the same thing if we were born mature. There was a paper, I, I, I have a hard time remembering exactly where, but they were looking at uh, the utero of certain animals, and especially the visual system, and they were seeing waves yeah, yeah, through, yeah, through there, yeah. and they were hypothesizing that maybe this is its training yeah, because well, one of the observations is that some of these basic orientations are there at birth. And so, like, well, how could they be learned, right, if they're there at birth? And the hypothesis is, um, well, is that in, in, when the child is developed in, in utero, um, there are these waves, as you said, of, of that, that lines of activation that travel across the retina in different orientations. And they would, in theory, could produce this learning here. Um, but, you know, that, again, so then some people have gone to the extent to say, oh, well, that proves that these aren't learned, which is bullshit. <laughs> it's total bullshit. Uh, because you can relearn these. So, the, you know, so just because you're born with some basic abilities at birth, that, you know, I don't think there's any, no one, I don't think anyone believes that you're born at birth being able to recognize a chair. I mean, it's like maybe you can start with a little bit of lines. Um, but... Uh, and so again, it could be an evolutionary advantage to, to save the, the animal from having to spend a certain amount of time learning these basic functions. They can be born with it. But you still have to learn. Uh, so it's not really a counterexample. It's like a weird one. Um, but some people will argue, well, these can't be learned because they're... You, you. I've had people tell me, neuroscientists, to my face, like, I don't believe V1 is learning anything. It's the person who studies V1. I'm like, you gotta be joking. It's the largest region of the cortex, and you don't think it's learning anything. And one of the arguments is like, well, when you're born, it already knows this. So what do you, what's it gonna learn? You know, it's a very simple idea, but I think they're totally wrong. Because you can't you can relearn these things through trauma or different patterns of input, or you could innovate it with something else. Um, so it's just just because you start off with a little bit of a boot, bootstrapping. Happy to sit here and think questions. How can you explain my inborn fear of clowns? 
<laughs> do, you, do you really have a fear of clowns? No, I'm just joking. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I guess it would be kind of a... Uh... But there, there, was just a, there was just something that... There was just something that came out. There was just something... Yeah. There was just something that came out that said that infants have a, have a fear of men with beards. Yeah. I well, I had nieces and nephews. And every, how old? How old are they? Uh, well, right now they're like four or five. But yeah. every time I hold a baby, baby's always staring at me. Okay. And like he's putting I my beard. Like, okay. Baby's like me for some reason. I, I, I don't. I don't. Like I don't put any. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> but it was. It was in. Uh, wait, wait. Don't tell me this a week ago or something like that. <laughs> maybe. Maybe they. Maybe they asked older kids. Like, okay, if you're gonna pick someone to, like they give these kids a, a choice, like you have to pick some teammates. And the teammate's gonna help you do something or the teammate's gonna protect you. And they pick the, the people to protect you with the beards and they pick the people to help you without the beard or something like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe I should change. <laughs> but the implication was somehow this is, the implication was somehow it's genetic, I don't know. Maybe just showing masculinity, I don't know. You can understand that, maybe. Hmm. All right, we done, done? All right, done, done. Thanks, yeah. Right. Thank you. I could do, next time I could do temple pooling and layers. Layers would be good, yeah. I'm always lost when you start talking about layers. Yeah, 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 me too. <laughs> okay, stopping the recording.